All right, there we go. Thank you very much, whoever that was. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Pro starting the project plan and management schedule, or plan and manage schedule. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on this one right now. Um, the objectives we're gonna cover in this topic today is plan, prepare, modify, and manage the project schedule based on methodology. Um, this is the ECO task 2.6. Um, so our topic D, plan and manage schedule. So the enablers, the things that we have to be able to do in order to accomplish these tasks in this in this part, in this topic. We have to be able to estimate project tasks. That's the milestones, dependencies, story points. We have to be able to use benchmarks, you know, um, industry uh, guidelines, industry projects that have done similar things that we might be using as a guide for how we would estimate our project out or historical data at our own company. Um, preparing schedules based on a methodology. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, we'll be talking about like a uh, critical path, um, you know, decomposing our activities and putting them, you know, dependencies and things like that, durations, um, bottom up or top down estimate types of things. Those are all different methodologies we might use. Uh, measure the ongoing progress based on the methodology. Uh, one of the methodologies we talk about in, in, in PMP is the earned value management. Um, and that's one way we measure progress and in, in the money we spend and how far we are in the schedule, things like that. Um, you'll need to be able to modify a schedule as needed based on the methodology. Uh, things change, so the schedule has to change with it sometimes. And when we do that, we also have to make sure that that the customers are aware of that, and we're we're letting the stakeholders know that things are changing. And then coordinate with other projects and other operations. These are the things that we have to do out there. Um, so let's go ahead and we'll get into the first thing. We have our deliverables that we do out here: um, activity cost estimates, activity duration estimates. I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but we do a lot of estimating, as you can see here. Um, estimating the, we have task estimates, cost durations, story point estimates, feature estimates. Lots of estimating that we're doing. Velocity data is a very uh, agile concept. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the velocity data. Essentially, it's how many story points you're getting done in a sprint when it boils down to it. And the project schedule, that's our whole end to end. The project is going to start here. It's going to finish here. And these are dates along the way. We sometimes use milestones. Sometimes we'll use a Gantt chart. Sometimes we'll just use, well, we'll use our, our uh, a PDM, like critical path. Um, we have a release plan, how we're going to release stuff into production. Um, again, that's we do releases in regular waterfall stuff, um, and then the release plan is a similar concept in, in Agile, but it's kind of a, a more, strangely enough, it's more structured than it would be in waterfall. Um, we have product roadmaps, you know, where we want to be with this particular project to help us you know, schedule along the way. If we're doing stuff in Agile, we're um, we're delivering uh, features. Okay, so it's like, hey, this is really important to them, so we're going to deliver this first. This is next most important, so we're going to deliver this second. This is the product roadmap that we're going to be going through, and they're going to tell us this is what we want. This is what we want first. This is what we want second. This we need this by this date. Uh, you can get the rest of it after that. That kind of stuff. Earn value is essentially the work that we've delivered. This is what they want, um, and this is how much value we've added after we delivered it. Um, updating the schedule, uh, updated schedule, we'll be delivering those as we change the schedule. Updated release plan as we change the, the releases or as we complete the releases. Updated product backlog, you know, we do stuff and the customers are like, well, I really like this, but now that we're seeing it, we need this too that kind of stuff. So you'll be updating your project product backlog to say, okay, here's new stuff that they want and they might be reprioritizing stuff. Uh, the network diagram, that's a, what we call PDM, uh, precedence diagram model, and that's the critical path stuff. We'll talk a lot about that coming up, something for everybody to keep in mind. Uh, planning meetings, you'll be doing a lot of planning meetings out there. And then negotiations. Um, 
when you're working with the clients or with your team. You might be somebody might be saying, "Hey, I can get this done in 20 days," and you're negotiating that down because 20 days seems really unreasonable. And what's the, you know, trying to figure out what the holdup is? And maybe it's well, we're going to negotiate for their time more. They're they're not going to be 100% on this, so we have to negotiate with them. Are their 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 functional managers, things like that. Lots of negotiations will be happening um, while we're calculating the schedule and managing and maintaining the schedule. Okay, any question about the deliverables? We're gonna get into more of this stuff, but is anything just really sticking out that's hurting anybody's brain right now? I'll take that as a no. Okay, so let's keep moving here. Um, the tools that we'll be using out here, we have top-down estimating. Expert, analogous, and parametric. Um, is everybody familiar with the the, the estimates there? The, the types of estimates that we have: bottom up estimating, analogous estimating, and parametric estimating. I believe you guys might have already talked about this some. Matt, you may want to cover it more. Okay, let's do that. Well, first, well, expert. An estimating, that's getting your experts to do your yeah. estimating. The people who are doing the task are people who have done the task before, are the guys who really know how much time it's going to take to do something. Analogous estimating, <clears throat> think of analogous estimating, well, we go back to the bottom-up estimate. Bottom-up estimate is we sit down with an expert, and he says, well, it'll take me 10 minutes to do this, and 20 minutes to do this, and an hour to do this, 10 days to do this, blah, blah, blah. And we roll all that up into an estimate. So we do a bottom up and it takes a lot of time to do those. Um, and on the old exam, they used to say it was the most accurate, but it was also the most expensive. So people didn't necessarily do them all the time. Um, I, I tend to disagree with that and they don't really emphasize the more accurate part of that now. They do talk about it being the most expensive type of estimate, which is true. Um, and then after you've estimated this task, you have an estimate. And then the next time you do the same thing over again, let's say we built a house and we're gonna build the same house, a little different elevation or something like that. You know, they want some different fixtures, but it's essentially the same house. We can say, well, you know what? We just built one of these in the same subdivision. Mostly it's gonna be the same type of stuff. So we're gonna say this, it's an analogous estimate. We're gonna take that estimate and we're gonna use it. We may tweak it some, you know, hey, it's in the same neighborhood, but it's on the it's on a lot with a hill as opposed to flat land and you know whatever. So we might have to tweak things, but we have an analogous estimate. So we estimate that out. We use that analogous estimate based on an originally a bottom up estimate. And then after a while, we've done hundreds to thousands of these types of estimates. We've been building houses and subdivisions in the region forever, and we've done so many of them that we can say, hey, we can build this house for you for $200 a square foot. That is a parametric estimate. So essentially, a parametric estimate, well, an analogous estimate is a bottom-up estimate that we did on something else very similar before. A parametric estimate is after we've got a whole bunch of those analogous estimates, we can parametize it. We can say, we can make this $200 a square foot or $50 an hour or you know, $200 a linear foot or something like that. So we can do whatever we need to with the parametric estimate based on old, older estimates that we did, lots and lots of them. Um, this will probably be questions on the exam and um, one of my questions on the exam when I took it, it was about building a house. And, and in the middle of the whole question, there was a $200 a square foot, they could build this house or something like that. And they asked what type of estimate was it. But they buried the language and they threw a whole bunch of other numbers at you. And as project managers, we do that a lot. We separate the, the weed from the chafe. And that's what you'll have to do on this exam. You have to separate the weed from the chafe. You'll have to throw out all that stuff that has nothing to do with how you're estimating this and find that find that 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 part of the question that says two hundred dollars a square foot. So you'll be looking for those kinds of things on the exam when you take the exam. And that is a, those are certain types of estimates that we do. That's what we talked about a lot in previous versions of of this exam prep. Um, T-shirt sizing. 
We get into t-shirt sizing a lot more now that we're talking a lot more agile. When we do t-shirt sizing, small, medium, large. Sometimes it's extra small and extra large and extra, extra large, et cetera. But essentially, we're, we're making it very, very simple. And this is kind of based on people's experience again. So that's t-shirt sizing. I shouldn't have too much difficulty with that. Think large, medium, small, or small, medium, large, however you want to put it. Estimating using Fibonacci. Are you guys familiar with estimating using the Fibonacci numbers and a modified Fibonacci? No. Nobody's familiar with that either. Well, when we work on Agile, we talk about Fibonacci, and I'm going to go over through this because they don't really talk about it in the deck here. So um, when we go through um, estimating for Agile, one of the techniques that they use is what we call a Fibonacci number, which is essentially you start with one, your basic unit of effort. So it might be, I can do, this is really, 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 really simple. It's about as simple as it gets. We're going to call that one point. Um, the next one up from that is twice that. So we say that's a two point story. It's twice as, it's twice as much work as a one. Then we take the one plus two and that gives us three. So the next unit up is three and it's three times what the other one was. Then we take the three and we add it to two, we get a five. So our next number in the Fibonacci sequence is five. And the next number after that, we take the, the five and the three and we get an eight and we take the eight and the five and we get a 13 and, and so forth. In a modified one, the next one number up is actually 20 instead of 21 because they round. But the the concept of what we're doing with Fibonacci, and you got to know this in real life, I'm, I'm assuming you'll have to know this on the exam, is that the bigger the story, the more latitude you have. So there's no difference between, there's no gap between one and two. A story is one point or it's two points. Um, and when you get to three, it's still just the one point difference between the two. When you get to a five, it could be a four or a five, really. And when you get to the eight, it could be a six, seven, or eight. And when we get to 13, it could be a nine, 10, 11, 12, or a 13 kind of thing. So the bigger the story, the more latitude you have. And it's supposed to represent the, the difficulty in estimating larger stories. And that's what we use the Fibonacci sequence for. Everybody should be familiar with that uh, that concept. That's an agile thing, and they talk about that a lot. Not everybody uses it, but they use it a lot out there in, in real life. So anybody have any question about Fibonacci? You can look that number up if you want Fibonacci. It's a sequence where you, the, the number is, the next number in the sequence is the sum of the last two numbers in the sequence that you that you've already covered. Uh, the next thing they talk about is story points, and we were just talking about story points with the Fibonacci number. Story points are is a unit of effort. Um, it's uh, they know that it's a unit of effort. In real life, story point is a is more complicated than that. Um, it's they don't want to call it time based. They don't want to say that hey, the story is two hours worth of work or four hours worth of work or eight hours worth of work. Um, but in the end, it kind of does come down to that because when we work on an agile project, you have this many people working on it for this much time in a sprint. You can get so many of these done. And so in the end, while we call it a unit of effort, story points are units of effort, um, it, it varies between team to team to team. Some people, the easiest task they started with with one might be twice as big as somebody else's one. Um, so two teams that use different story point methodologies or different, they start with a different what is one point, may end up with doing the same task and one of them has a 13 and one of them has an 8. So, um, and they're doing the same amount of work, the same skilled people. It's just that, that team's version of what is a story point. And so you can't really compare this outside of your team. These are design story points are designed for your team to improve their velocity, to improve the way they get things done and how fast they get things done and how, how much better they get things done. This is not a, um, you can't say, well, yeah, you guys are 
you're only doing 10 points a week. Well, if your 10 points a week is like somebody else's 100 points a week, well, you're doing just as much work as they are. You're just your units are you know, represent bigger amounts of work. So keep that in mind with story points. Um, and then we get into relative at relative estimating, which kind of hammers that point home. It's a relative estimate. When we talked about the Fibonacci number, we have a one and we have a two. Two is, relatively speaking, it's twice as much effort as, as a one-point story and so forth. So we use relative estimating. Um, and then we have affinity estimates. I don't want to get too much into those. You guys can look that up. It's a simple definition, and I don't think you'll have that on the exam. PMIS, are you guys familiar with that? Have you already talked about PMIS? Other material out there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, no. good. It's just PMIS is just a project management information system. It's a it's a way to track it. If you've done IT here at AT and T for a very long time or even just shortly, we use a product called Prism that, that we developed a long time ago that's supposed to mimic what, what used to be in the PMBOK. <laughs> so um that that's one project management information system. Some people turn a Microsoft project into a PMIS. It's a, you they build that all out. ADO, if you're using ADO out here today in AT and T, that's a PMIS system. There's lots of different systems out there. Somebody else's PMIS might be a notebook with a with a with a pen, you know, or a pencil. So um that's uh, that's the PMIS. Um, probably you'll get a question maybe on that on the exam. Not a big thing. Uh, process assets. Um, I don't want to go too much into all of these. The, the first one that Colin covered a lot of that. Process at, process assets are are assets that you guys develop throughout the process. So you if you have a, a architectural diagram, that's a process asset, so forth. Backlog management is managing your backlog. You know the, all the story points you haven't delivered yet. Your release planning is how you plan your releases. Your iteration planning, that's based on the team itself and, and how they're going to plan their iteration. We're going to do, we say we're going to do this many story points in a sprint. And as a team, we agree that we can do all of these tasks, all of these story points, get all these story points done in our iteration. And the whole process of doing that is iteration planning. Burn down and burn up charts are tracking how much stuff we have left to do or tracking how much stuff that we did. So you got your burn down and your burn ups. Uh, cumulative flow diagram is another agile diagram that we use. It's kind of, when you look at the chart, it's, there's a, it's a line, it's a couple line graphs depending on how you're breaking down the work that you're doing. And you'll have at the beginning, everything starts at the bottom left hand corner. And it, as it progresses, you'll have one line that will be, kind of lower and it gets bigger faster that's everything below that line is work that you got done and then you'll have another line that's right above that and the that narrow band is kind of the work that you're working on and everything above that line is work that has to be done now you might have another line or two in there because you've got work that's done and then you have work that's done but not tested and then you have work that's done and tested but not not put into pro into production kind of thing cumulative flow diagrams you should see you should see uh, the bottom part of the graph get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and that that line in the middle that where you're actually doing the work should stay pretty steady the whole time it should stay about the same that band should stay about the same thickness your throughput analysis is kind of just it's another ex method of analyzing your stuff. Um, you can actually tell throughput from your cumulative flow diagram. If you see the the bottom part of your graph keeps growing, you know you're you're doing some serious throughput. Your velocity analysis, how fast we're getting through our iterations. Retrospectives, it's a key you know that you'll use to at the team will do at the end of their sprints or every other sprint or whatever. To talk about what works and doesn't work, kind of stuff. Uh, review work produced, that's pretty much the same thing. Scaling projects, you know, hey, we got small, you know, we might be t-shirt sizing it, so we scale these up. We'll be doing meetings, we'll be doing procurement negotiations if you have to have equipment or you need materials or you want to procure, oh, I can't say that word, procure contract help, something like that. So you'll have negotiations for that. 
Any question on these tools right now? I'm kind of going through this fast, but we're going to talk about this stuff in more a little bit, and we'll get the the really meaty part of this in 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 a few in a few slides here. Any questions so far on this? Okay. Project schedule and output of schedule and model represent, uh, presents linked activities with plan dates, durations, milestones, and resources. It's a, it's a mouthful of stuff, essentially what our schedule is. It's these linked activities. It's like, I do this, and I can't do this other task until I get this one done, maybe. Or I can do these two tasks together. All of the tasks that we have are somehow related to other tasks in the project, and they all have to get done when we're done to call the project done. So we have a schedule. We start at the beginning, we do an activity, we do another activity, we do another activity, do another activity until we're finished. Um, each of those activities and the project itself has to have a start and a finish activities on specific dates in, in a certain sequence. Um, and this changes. We talked about that when we work in Agile, we change things around a lot there. They get one particular deliverable and then they decide hey you know what we got this but we didn't realize we're going to need this other thing first now because we just realized that when you delivered this so you'll have starting and finishing activities on and we have to have specific dates we want this on this date this on this date if we don't do those um if we don't do those activities by that certain date then we trigger um, uh, monitoring exceptions or progress exceptions or things like that. So it's like, hey, we said we'd get this done by now, but we didn't. What's the problem? You know, and what's our threshold for raising the, the that that specter of, hey, there's a problem. Uh, specified plan dates for meeting project milestones. So we got all these activities that we do, and once we finish those, we hit a milestone. And then we hit another milestone. And milestones, just for the record, milestones are zero duration activities out there. You guys might want to write that down. Milestones are zero duration activities. So like when you talk about a birthday, um, today is my birthday. My birthday didn't last a year. My birthday doesn't last a day. It's, it's a zero duration milestone that at this point in time, on my birthday, I I finished another year's worth of progress. So it's the same kind of thing. Our milestones are like that. They're a zero duration activity. So I might be in the year between now and my next birthday. I have all these other things. They all have durations, you know. I go to work every day, you know, eight hours a day. I got, you know, I got a whole bunch of those eight hour day tasks that I have to do. They all have durations. I'm going to take a vacation for a few weeks. It has a duration. All these things have durations, but the milestones are a zero duration activity. And when you look at uh, the Microsoft project, like the example that they have on my screen right now, um, the, all of these things have uh, durations. They all have a, the bar covers a certain amount on that on that bar chart on the right side of the the graph but a duration will just be a little diamond in a specific spot so keep that in mind that milestones are zero duration stuff uh, coordinate activities to form a master plan in order to complete the project objective on time that's what we'll be talking about with the PDM the critical path uh, track schedule performance, keep upper management and project stakeholders informed about a project status. That's one of the other things we do with that schedule. If we don't know how long it's going to take to do this one particular task, how do we know that we're on track or that we're we're behind schedule? So we need to be able to, to track those kinds of things. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we assign those estimates. If we're, if we're off on our estimate, maybe it's a bad estimate. Maybe we're really behind because of some other things. But keeping track of our schedule is really important out here. And it's something you guys will meet. It, there's going to be a lot of questions on this stuff. So far, any questions about the schedule? An output of the schedule model that, rep, that presents linked activities with planned dates, durations, milestone, and resources. Any question on that? You don't have to memorize that, but just understand what the schedule is and make sure that you're aware that it's 
durations, milestones, resources, and, and plan dates. Okay, any questions? Okay, we're just kind of flying through stuff here, so slow me down if I'm going too fast. All right, benchmarks and historical data. When scheduling, benchmarking is a comparison of the project schedule to a schedule for a similar product or service produced elsewhere. So if um, I am constructing a piece of highway, you know, a two mile stretch of highway um, that I've never done before, but another company did a two mile stretch of highway through the same type of terrain. Um, they took this long to do it. There's a benchmark right there. Any questions about a benchmark? So it can be useful in the initial stage of the scheduling to help assess the feasibility of a project, but like all analogous type estimates, one of the things that we talked about that I mentioned before when we talked about the estimating, uh, benchmarking is essentially an analogous type of estimate. Um, and it's a starting point. Like if I'm building, like I said, we're building another house in the same subdivision, we said, oh, we can do it for this much, but, it's also on a hill and the other one was on flat ground. So we have to do this and we have to do this and we have to do this. So it you have to adjust it from the benchmark. You can't just take the benchmark and say, oh, yeah, this is it. Um, historical data can come from other projects completed within the organization for which detailed information is available. Now, I would actually call historical data benchmarking as well. Um, it's just you're using internal stuff versus benchmarking, which is stuff that was produced elsewhere. Any any questions on historical data and benchmarking? It's they're the same type of thing. They're calling historical data internal, benchmarking is external. A any questions on that? The concept is important, uh, but we kind of talk about that with analogous estimating. Just make sure that you know that that's what these are. All right, everybody's quiet. Schedule management plan. Okay, here we go. Oh, it's blocking my screen. I can't see it, but the, there it goes. Okay. Okay, schedule management plan, a component of the project or program management plan that establishes the criteria and activities for developing, monitoring, and controlling the schedule. Essentially, the schedule management plan, like all of the management plans that we talk about in this stuff, we it was much more um, obvious in the PMBOK. When you do the PMBOK, some one of the first activities in every chapter is going to be a management plan thing. Schedule management plan, cost management plan, quality management plan, risk management plan, etc. You'll have all of those, a communication management plan. Um, we do all that at the beginning of the project and we're getting in here now, we're getting into the schedule management plan and what the schedule management plan and every other management plan that we're talking about is it's going to tell us how to do something. It doesn't tell us what we're putting in in the in the schedule. It it's not the baseline is not part of the schedule management plan. The actual schedule is not part of the management plan, but it will tell us how we're going to do stuff. It will say, for instance, like when I'm how am I going to estimate this? Am I going to use analogous estimates? Am I going to use parametric estimates? Am I going to need bottom up estimates? Um, it will say things like what kind of um, what kind of uh, accuracy am I looking for? You know, hey, when we do this thing, I want this percentage accuracy um, out of the gate or whatever. Um, and we'll talk about precision. You know, if I am if if I my project is adding on a bathroom or I'm modifying the bathroom, maybe it's a two day task. If it's a two-day task, you know, all of our tasks might be broken down by the hour. If I'm landing a man on the moon 10 years from now or I'm landing a man on Mars 10 years from now, probably we're not going to be as precise as a couple of hours per task. You know, we'll be looking at tasks in, in years or in quarters or months even. So um, we'll be just the project, the schedule management plan will tell us what units we're going to use for precision, what units we're going to use for accuracy, what units we're going to use for time. How are we calculating folks' hours out there? Are we doing it man hours? Are we doing it, you know, 
span months, span years? Are we doing it by, you know, whatever we're doing it by, it will tell us how we do them. Um, describes how activities will be defined and progressively elaborated. Now that's in the case of an agile project and other projects too, but um, are you guys familiar with progressive elaboration or rolling wave? Anybody have any questions about progressive elaboration or rolling wave? What is rolling wave? Um, rolling wave and progressive elaboration are essentially that I detail my estimate prior to the activity. So if I'm going to land a man on Mars, the stuff that is two years from now, I'm not going to estimate those out very well. Um, I'm going to, the, there's going to be a big gap between reality and, and, and the actual task duration when we do it, because there's just a whole lot of unknowns and it's far down the road and we don't want to spend time because things could change before we get there. But the stuff that I'm going to do tomorrow or in the next sprint, I want to have much better, I want to have much better estimates on that. So we progressively elaborate, we do a rolling wave estimate, call a rolling wave estimate where the stuff that we're doing right now, we want to estimate really well. The stuff we're doing down the road, we're not so we're not so um, uptight about that estimate. So we're going to identify a schedule method in the scheduling tool to be used. So, hey, we're going to use um, Microsoft Project. We're using ADO. We're using Excel. We're using a notebook with a pen and a, or a pencil. Whatever method we use, the project manage or the schedule management plan, which is part of the project management plan, will tell you how you're going to, to schedule and the method you're going to use to schedule and the tools that you're going to use. Uh, determine the format of your schedule. Establish criteria for developing and controlling the project schedule. So how are we going to, you know, not only are we talking about how we're going to develop it and what criteria we're using to develop the schedule, but how we're going to control that project schedule. What are my thresholds when we're behind schedule? What are my thresholds when, you know, um, depending on, on risk and things like that and, and people's tolerance for risk? Hey, you know, we're, we're two days we're two days behind, but, you know, two days behind on a 10-year project is not a big deal. Two days behind on a one-week project, that's a huge deal. So you'll have criteria for developing and controlling your project schedule, and that will all be laid out in the schedule management plan. Any questions on that part? Okay. Components of the schedule management plan, the project schedule model use, so how we're going to do this. Uh, accuracy of activity duration estimates, how accurate, we talked about that, how accurate do they need to be? You know, plus or minus 10%, plus or minus 20%, plus or minus 50%. Um, and, and then where where we are in that, if it's, you know, next sprint maybe need to be much more accurate than, again, than 20 sprints down the road. Unit of measure to be used. You know, are we using weeks, months, quarters? We talked about that too. You know, it you know, depends on the length of the project. We probably determined a lot of that. Organizational procedure links used with the WBS. Um, you guys all did the WBS already when you talked about scope, and um, you could tie um, procedures to those tasks in the WBS. Who's doing what? You got those the control accounts, things like that. Uh, control thresholds to be used for monitoring the schedule performance. Hey, you know we're 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 a day behind. Does that does that trigger any any uh, mitigation? Um, are where is that where is that threshold? Rules of performance measurements to be used. Are we using earned value management? Are we using different types of 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 things to measure our 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 performance? Uh, reporting formats to be used. Do they want it in a spreadsheet? Do they want it in a PowerPoint? Do you want to have a meeting? Do you want to have a, a WebEx? Do you want to have a face-to-face? -face? Or do you just send them a link to a dashboard? All those are formats that you might be using to present your reports. Uh, and, and what kind of reports that you have. Process descriptions to explain how schedule managed processes are to be documented throughout the project. So you're going to say, this is how we're going to do this, this is how we're going to do this. Again, the schedule management plan and all the management plans are telling you how you're going to do the stuff, not what you're going to be doing there. 
it's going to tell you how you're going to do all of the things that you're going to do in that particular knowledge area. Okay, any questions on this part? Where are we at on our time? Oh, good. We're moving along well. Schedule management considerations for agile adaptive environments. Um, total project timeline may be developed. Um, and well, let's go through these all and then we'll talk about this. We'll come back and go over this a little bit more. Uh, individual activities scheduled iteratively, two main iterative approaches. There's the iterative scheduling with the backlog and on-demand scheduling. Um, so first of all, when we talk about scheduling with Agile, there's Agile is a little different than Waterfall. And, and it's, it's kind of a, um, they talk about Agile as kind of flipping the model. Um, uh, when we when we go through this stuff, like for instance, I have I think ten years ago, twenty years ago, um, somebody comes to me with a project. We want to do this, and we want it in this amount of time, and we want and we're going to spend this kind of money on it. And we'll look at that and we'll say, well, we can't do all of that in that amount of time. We'll need this much more time. We're going to need this much more money. So at the beginning, we said this is how much time, and this is how much scope we're going to give you for the amount of money that you're talking about. And with Agile, it's there's they have that same list of things and they say we're going to give you this much money and this much time to do it in, but there's not really a negotiation on that. But the the, the thing is is that we have kind of sort of a, a red line. So they prioritize all of their activities and they have this red line and we deliver we 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 commit to delivering everything above this red line anything else that we can't do we're going to it's going to be below that line and they may or may not get it depending on how well we do um so generally speaking there's not a whole lot of change process when we do that with uh, with agile but with waterfall it's hey you know what um we're doing this stuff and we th this is something we didn't take into consideration um or that you didn't tell us about or whatever so we're going to need more money and we're going to need more time. Then you do a change process. You do a change request. You do all of that kind of stuff. Um, so essentially what happens is, is they give you amount of money and time and you deliver what you can deliver. And that, that's kind of what happens with Agile. And then they have the two main iterative approaches with iterative scheduling with backlog. And that's kind of like what we do with the sprints. And then on demand is kind of like Kanban. So it's like in this iterative scheduling with the backlog, it's like this sprint, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And next sprint, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And next sprint, we're going to do this, 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 this. On-demand scheduling with Kanban, you have this backlog. You have this chunk of work that has to be done. And people start picking things out on the team, and they'll say, I'm going to start working on this. I'm going to start working on this. And, and they kind of have to go by this, you know, their things are prioritized, but they're picking things off and they're working them. But, you know, maybe it takes more than a sprint to do it. Maybe it takes two sprints to do it or more than that even. But but there isn't really a sprint concept with the Kanban. It's we have work and we have work in progress. I, I mean, we have we have a backlog, we have work in progress, and we have work that's done kind of. Um, so you'll need to know those, and we'll talk about those in a little bit more, I believe, coming up here. Any question about uh, about the considerations for Agile? We, we will talk about this more, but if you guys got questions just right now that are just completely blowing you out of the water. Just a real quick reminder on on-demand scheduling, Matt. I was wondering, is, is it, it's just been a while since I've been in that type of environment. Um, is that based on, you know, when you when you say you're picking from the backlog, is that still a prioritized Backlog. It's a prioritized backlog still, yes. I mean, it, really, the customer still wants things done, and they, you know, it's like if they have stuff in their backlog that's nice to have, they don't want you doing those first. They want the stuff that you have to have. And and as a team, you may end up picking some of those things out because um, it, it's required for some of the stuff that must have. You know, it's like, well, they don't really need this, but we need this so that we can do these other things yeah. or that we can do these other things easily. So as a team, you guys would be working those things out in in your in your in your meetings. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the iterative scheduling with backlog, we have progressive elaboration, rolling wave. I was talking about that before. So essentially, you're estimating well, tightly upfront stuff down the road. You're estimating your estimates are a lot looser. 
uh, use a specific time window, often two weeks. This is what we call a sprint or an iteration or as in other names too. Those are the two big ones that we use. Um, requirements are defined in user stories. So it's like, hey, as a user, I want to do this so that I can do this. That's your user story. Um, and you, you assign points to those. We talked about the story points earlier and the Fibonacci numbers and other things. Uh, those stories are prioritized, selected based on the priority in the time box. So it's, hey, we got to get this stuff done and it can, we can do this in the sprint and so we'll do that. Uh, remaining stories are added to the backlog and constructed later based on their priority. So you'll do things as you're prioritized. Delivers business value early and incrementally. Um, that's um, that's the goal. I mean, it doesn't always happen that way, but that's what they're asking for. So it's like it, we give them a, a minimal viable product that they can use right out of the gate. Um, we can tweak that as we move along, but we'll deliver them stuff. The concept is to continuously deliver, you know, the continuous pipeline. You know, we'll give them this, we'll give them this, we'll give them this, we'll give them this. Everything we give them, they can start using right away. Allows changes and adaptations during the entire pro project. So again, we go through this whole thing. We give them this, they use it, they come back and they say, you know what, we like this, but you know what, we hate typing all these things in here. Can you give us a drop down? So you've got a, you've got an adaptation or a change that they want before you maybe pick up something else. Uh, does not work well when there's complex dependency relationships. And I was kind of talking about this um, when we talked about PDM. If you've got a lot of, um, sometimes you have tasks that there's a lot of dependencies. And so one task can't get done until you get all these other things done first. Um, it's hard to, a lot of these other tasks are, don't really deliver something, you know? I mean, it's delivering um, the groundwork, but it's like you, when you pour a foundation on a house, you can't live in it yet. So, you you know, if you gotta be building a 20,000 square foot home and you've got a basement without even the first floor on it yet, that's versus, you know, how long it took you to do that. And in the same amount of time, you could probably build a little shed with a, with a bed and a sink and a toilet and a roof over your head. In, in that same amount of time. So we have we have infrastructure sometimes that needs to be built and if you have a lot of those dependencies, sometimes iterative scheduling, you know, sprints are not necessarily the easy way to go because you complete a whole sprint and you deliver nothing for the for the clients right away. I mean you got things done but but nothing for them to use yet. And that's one of the things they're saying right here. It does not work well when there's complex dependency relationships. Any question about iterative scheduling? Thinking about sprints, or we're thinking about um, iterations. Okay. On-demand scheduling, and this is when I was talking about Kanban and lean methodologies. Um, we don't use that traditional schedule. They they pull their work from the queue when they're available. I finished this, so I'm going to go back and get the next thing. Um, it still provides incremental business value, um, and, but and when they say it levels out the work of the team members, it's um, I'm not sure that's uh, what's the word I'm looking for. I'm not sure that's actually a, an accurate thing. I mean, if when we got when you got two people that are um, what's the word I'm looking for? If, if somebody picks up a big project, a big a big story in a sprint, somebody else is probably picking up two smaller stories or maybe three smaller stories, and and it equals out. You guys work the entire sprint. So I'm not sure how much this really levels the work of the team members. Essentially, when I get done, I can move on to the next thing and I'm not limited by a sprint. So if I have two tasks that are that take a, a, a sprint and a half, then you know, then what am I doing for the rest of my time kind of thing? And and it's I, I think it's a I don't want to call it a moot thing, but it's stuff that people work out. You know, it, it happens, the team, they deal with those kinds of things. So I don't know that that really levels out the work of the team members, but remember that. Um, works best when activities can be divided into equal amounts, and I think kind of that's actually, that's what they're saying here. I feel like, generally speaking, when I use Kanban, it's kind of the other way around. But think of it that way. Works best when activities can be divided into equal amounts. Does not work well when there's complex dependency relationships. Kind of the same in the other one. Um, 
that's waterfall kicks in on that because we plan all that stuff out and we we cover all that. So when you do waterfall, all those complex dependencies, legacy code in, in general is like that. Or if you're building a skyscraper, um, you can't say, okay, I want, you know what, my footprint at the beginning, the 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 the, the base of the the skyscraper is 200 square feet shorter than what I really need. So we're going to tear down the skyscraper and we're going to add on those extra 20 feet. Uh, the complex dependencies, all that that infrastructure has to be planned out and and really well defined before you can jump into some of the other stuff. And that's kind of an agile issue altogether. That it's harder to deal with those types of things. Any question on on demand? Okay, the, the, when you're on demand, think of Kanban and think of lean technology. They're pr pretty much the same thing. Um, just Kanban is classically uses the Kanban board. Okay, guidelines to develop schedule management plan. Review the project management plan for information to develop a schedule. Obviously, we have to do that. We gotta go and look at our scope and see what it is that we're gonna schedule, right? So we gotta go back and look at the project management plan for that kind of stuff. Review the project charter for a summary high-level milestone schedule. This is what they want, this is when they want it. Okay, so that's at a high level, We that's our schedule really, right? Um, uh, and then we have to find out, first of all, if that's feasible, and then how do we get it there? Uh, review the EEFs, review the OPAs. So we have their in, enterprise environmental factors, and we have our organizational process assets, all the stuff that the company or the industry says you should do. Use tools and techniques as expert judgment, such as expert judgment and historical information. So when we're doing these estimates, we're going to use the guys who are doing the work, and we're going to say, how long would it take you to do this, right? That's what the expert judgment is, comes into here. Um, and then the historical information or the benchmarking, all that stuff, those are, that's the, that's the analogous estimates that we might be using out there. Use meetings to develop the schedule management plan. So you're going to sit down with folks and you're going to say, here's the plan. We're trying to do this and this and this. Does this work for you when we're talking to stakeholders and we're saying, um, this is how we're going to notify you about the, you know, our progress on on the on the schedule. This is how we're going to notify you when we we're going to hit this threshold. We're going to notify you that we're we're over we're you know we're behind schedule or whatever. We'll send it to you in this format. We'll do all those other kinds of things. We sit down at a meeting. We discuss all of those uh, all of those items. Document the schedule management plan for the do for the project. So once we decide all that stuff and we got it all written down, well, then it's documented and we put it in the project management plan. Any questions about that? Okay, where are we at here? Okay, we'll get this slide and then we'll take a break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back. Project activities. The activity is a distinct scheduled portion of work performed during the course of the project. So when we had that WBS, we broke down stuff into different um, work packages, work items in the project, in the in the WBS. Everybody remembers that? Hopefully everybody remembers that when you talk scope, the WBS. Well, once we get that work package, we're gonna start breaking those activities down even further. Well, we're breaking them down into activities and tasks. So in general terms, in general, the terms activity, work package, and task might be used interchangeably in this process. Project management environments each has a distinct meaning. A work package is the lowest level of the WBS. An activity is a smaller component of a decomposed work package. And a task is used when referring to project management software. Um, I tend to think of a task as an activity broken down even further. but. Any questions about an activity? We're going to need to know that because when we get to these activities, the whole point in breaking these down is that we can estimate these things much more reasonably. We all know, you know, if you're in the construction business and you pour concrete foundations every day, you know how long it takes to excavate a hole when you've got just plain old dirt, and you know how long it takes to excavate a hole when you got to when you got to get rid of bedrock, you know, how long it takes to put up a form, you know, how long it takes to do this. So you have those individual tasks, you can estimate them out pretty easily. And that's why we break them down like this. So we can, we can estimate them out and, and then 
say, okay, it's going to take this much time, this much money. So when we break them out, we're also breaking them out. We're thinking about the cost as well. Any questions about project activities? Anybody? These, by the way, are what we'll be breaking down in the, or that we'll be working with, those activities we'll be working with when we do critical path. Okay, well, let's, um, I have five minutes till, so let's uh, come back in five minutes, five minutes after, according to my, my clock right now, I got five till. So at, at five after, we'll come back, everybody can go hit the restroom, get yourself a cup of coffee or some tea or whatever you need or a glass of water. And I'm going to be right here, so if anybody has any other questions, you feel free to ask me here in the next 10 minutes, um, as long as it's on stuff we've already talked about or previous stuff. Okay? Hey, Matt, can you go over, yeah, Matt, can you go over, like, lean methodologies again? Is that just another name for Kanban? Um, it's not technically. It's not another name for Kanban. You know, there's uh, all the subtleties out there. When we talk about agile, agile is lean. Agile can be Kanban. Agile can be Scrum. That's when we have the sprints and things like that. Um, agile can be XP, and and they all have their. They all have their. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They all have their strong points, and they all have their peccadillos. You know. Um, like when we talk about XP, um, which I don't know if they'll actually refer to XP too much in here, but when you're working with Agile, one of the things we talk about is extreme programming. And, and, and the hallmark of extreme programming is that you work in pairs. You have one person who navigates and one person who drives. So when you're coding, you got the guy, he's typing the lines of code, and there's a guy right over his shoulder who's going, hey, you know what, let me it would be better to try this one out, and he'll be Googling this and that, and he'll say, oh, hey, we can try this instead, you know. <clears throat> so the navigator is kind of as important as the guy who's actually typing the code, um, and and that's a hallmark of that, and, and sometimes they work those in sprints, and sometimes they do those in Kanban. Um, Lean is essentially, um, it kind of came out of the, I want to say it came out of Six Sigma, but don't, that won't be on the test, and don't quote me on that, but kind of the whole lean process was trying to eliminate things that you don't need. Um, the best the best lines of codes are the ones that you don't have to write. So if you're writing code to do something that, that nobody's ever going to use, well, if you don't write that code, well, look how much time you just saved. Um, if you can write code to do this better in a, in a much more compact, efficient manner, how much that's that's that much better. So lean is essentially about not writing code. <laughs> it's not it's not about the code that you write. It's about the code that you don't write. And and the whole point behind lean is to it's to make this whole thing just what the customer asks for and nothing else. That's why it the hall one of the hallmarks of lean is is frequent um, demos with the client and they look at that and they're like, well, I don't really need that. I don't really need that. I don't really need that. So we kind of eliminate that kind of stuff when you're working on the project. Does that help? It does. Thank you very much. Okay. Any any other questions? Anybody else have any questions? Hey, Matthew, this is Min. Um, earlier today, you mentioned about the difference between uh, analogous parametrics and expert. I see the the difference between analogous and and parametric, but to me. Uh, the expert is basically similar to the parametric or the analogous. It, 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 it sort of is, Min. It, let me, because what we used to, you know, when we did it in PMBOK, if you look in the PMBOK, they talk about bottom up and then they talk about analogous and then they talk about parametric. Um, expert is really, I mean, all of our all of our estimates should be experts, are based on expert opinion. Um, you know, we talk about science a lot of time. We say science is built on the shoulders of other people. You know, we develop this, and then, um, and then, twenty years from now, somebody's going to use what we develop, and they're going to build on top of that. When we do these estimates, um, a parametric is essentially that we we're using estimates that the hundreds of people or hundreds of times we've done this over and over and over and over again. 
So that's what we do with parametrics. And parametric, generally speaking, it's linear kind of work. You know, we do, you know, we can we can narrow it down to two hundred dollars a square foot or, or fifty dollars an hour or whatever. Um, but at the heart of it all, it was it's um, expert. It's expert people that come in and they say, I can do the, you know, kind of like the old. Um, um, oh, I can't name that tune. I can name that tune in five notes. You know, they these guys are the guys who can come out and say, I can do this. I can write this line, this, this code in, in 10 hours. I can write this code in two hours. I can write this code, whatever. They're the guys who know, and they're, they're the people who do it, the experts out there. Um, those are those are the experts that we're talking about. And all these estimates at some point in time were an expert estimate. Uh, it's just... Once you start using parametric estimates, you kind of forget the experts who came up with it because it's it's now you're just it's hey you know it takes us we can do this for two hundred dollars a square foot or you know fifty dollars a linear foot or whatever. So that's that's the whole estimate thing. Um, I wouldn't I would not put expert estimate in in, in the same category as bottom up. And parametric and analogous. I, I know they did that on that slide, but don't think of them that way. I, I would think of an expert estimate. An expert estimate is an ex estimate done by an expert in in the field. I mean, you know, if you know, if I'm a if I'm a electrical engineer, I any estimating concrete is. Not, I'm not an expert at estimating how much flat concrete I need to 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 pave a, a driveway. You know. And, and vice versa, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a expert in, in so construction so Matthew, my, my, and Matthew, sorry for interruption. My, my point here is if on the task, um, they're talking about, you know, um, like what you mentioned earlier, the parametric, I can do this one with $200 per square foot or whatever it is. And then they put in the word expert in there. How, how, how can I correlate it? Whether it's an expert or parametric? Well, here's, like here's, here's the thing. If you get a question on the exam, and they say, um, you're, these people are looking at this house, or they're looking at this, and the guy says, you can do, we can do this for $200 a square foot, or $200 an hour, or $50 an hour, or whatever. A, a unit divide, you know, a unit per unit kind of thing. If you see that type of thing, it's a parametric estimate. If, if the guy who's doing it is an expert, it's still a parametric estimate. If they talk about estimates and you're bringing in a guy who knows the material, but they don't say that he's doing an analogous estimate or he's not doing anything else, then you could probably then the probably the correct answer is an expert. If they mention that you're comparing this s you're comparing the same work, you know we built the house and now we're going to use that same estimate to build another house, that's an analogous estimate, even if it's an expert who put it together. Um, and think of an I got, expert. I, got it. I think I think that example uh, answered my question right there. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, good. yeah. I, I got it. Uh, Thank you. Now, yeah. I'm, and and, and I tell you what, I have not taken the new exam. I'm I'm kind of spitballing, but generally speaking, you want to be there's things they're going to be looking for, and there'll be right answers, and there'll be better right answers. Um, you know, like when we talk about other things, you'll see that out there. If we're talking about transportation but they're specifically talking about two wheels you're talking about a motorcycle or a bicycle um, a car will not work if you say well it's transportation well yeah it's transportation but there was a better answer when it was talking two wheels you were talking about a car I mean a, a, a bike or a motorcycle so if if they talk about two wheels getting from point A to point B, transportation is one of your answers and a bicycle is one of your answers, it's going to be bicycle. There's going to be the better right answer with, when you see that on the exam. They did that before. I assume they'll continue to do things like that. There, you know, there will be a, a right answer, more than one right answer, but there'll be a better answer or a best answer out there. Okay. Thank All you. Right, well, we got like another minute or two here. Does anybody else have any questions before we resume? Any other questions? Okay.
sucks. I can't see my clock on my computer. I have to use my watch here now. And I'm analog today, so. I think we got another minute here. Give everybody another minute, and then we'll jump right in again. Matt, I'm not sure who's taking attendance, but when I see participants with just numbers, I'm wondering how they're resolving those issues. Well, here's the thing. If you just, now some people have numbers and they have their thing out there. They call in, but then they're, you know, they dial in separately. Yep. Um, but anybody, they, they're, you know, you guys can go out on the PMN website and, and submit your I actually ask people if you have problems dialing in and that you think that it doesn't know who you are, do let me know. I think I asked folks that early on too. I didn't ask that today, but but in general, let me know. And um, that way, when you submit your thing, I'll know who you are. I, I don't think it really matters. I think Brian's going to say, go ahead and prove them anyway. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, so, um, Project activities where we left off. Hopefully everybody's back now. All right, so we covered project activities. Nobody has any other questions about the project activities, right? Okay, features. Uh, features use the group related functionality together to deliver business value activities and efforts such as documentation, bug fixes, testing, quality, defects, repairs, delivery of the capability can be estimated, tracked, managed as a set. Scheduling aligned to features associated, ensures associated work is coordinated, blah, blah, blah. We have all these kinds of things. And when we talk about a feature, we're talking about a group of, of things, right? And when we talk about a feature, it's, um, you know, it maybe it's a order entry screen is a feature. Um, and somebody may even drill down further, you know, it's a, it's a uh, enter button on an on a order entry screen as a feature our edit button on the order entry screen is a feature. A feature is kind of a group of functionality. And you might have, you know, when we do the, you might think almost as a, as a work package as being a feature, um, along with all the other stuff that kind of goes with it. So we estimate out some of those features and eventually we'll drill those down into user stories. Um, anybody have any questions about features? Features. You might've heard Epic, sometimes people have, Features are epics, then features, and then user stories, and Agile can do those in all kinds of different orders. So any questions on features? These are pretty, it's a block of functionality, a block of things that we do. All right, milestones, a significant point or event in a project program portfolio. Um, how long do milestones last? Anybody want to venture a guess? There's no time, no time they have no time. That's right. Yep. There is a zero. You know, that's right. Zero duration. Milestones are zero durations. But it's a significant point or event in the project portfolio or program. Guidelines for estimating project activities. So here's what we're going to how we're going to estimate those out. Review the schedule management plan, which tells us how we're going to estimate the project activities, right? It's going to tell us how we do all of this stuff on the schedule. Review the scope baseline for the WBS, deliverables, assumptions, and constraints. So when we look at that scope baseline and we got all the stuff that we need to do out there, all the assumptions and all our constraints, we're gonna take that into consideration when we're gonna estimate these project activities. We're gonna review the enterprise environmental factors and the, the um, organizational process assets. Uh, on a blank there sometimes. We're going to look at how the company and how the industry uses, does these kinds of things. Uh, we're going to analyze and decompose each work package of the WBS and activities that will be required to produce the deliverable. So we're decomposing more. We're de 
we broke things down when we did the WBS, and now we're going to decompose them down into these activities. We're going to consult our subject matter experts about unfamiliar material. How do we estimate something when we don't even have a clue what it is that we're talking about? We're going to evaluate all the constraints and assumptions for possible impacts on the activity duration. Um, once you have decomposed each work package into activities, evaluate your activity list. Well, yeah, okay, we're so all that should be kind of common knowledge. I mean, we, you know, I don't know what kind of how they'll have that on the exam. Um, I seriously doubt they're going to have all of these bullets and you're going to have to link them all up or whatever. But they might, they'll ask you questions about it, though. So um, they have this activity here, and we're going to skip over this activity, but just um, wait, hold on. Oh, I guess we don't have to worry about that. So we're activity dependency. An activity dependency is a logical relationship that exists between two project activities. So if I am um, going to remodel my office and they're going to they're going to strip it down and then they're going to put everything back, painting is dependent on them having the drywall up and taped and mudded and and everything is all all that's done. You can't paint until you have the walls, right? That is a relationship that is mandatory. A relationship indicates whether the start of the activity is contingent on an event or input from an outside activity. So um, when we talk about some of these kinds of things, we can't start pouring concrete until the guy with the mixer comes, right? So there's a we that's a kind of an outside thing maybe. Activity dependencies determine the precedence relationship. So I can't do this activity until I did this other activity. So now we're starting to get more into this. Example, designing room layouts. Architect needs to assess the functionality of his room design. You can't assess, you know, assessment can't start until workers finish framing the walls, windows, and roof. And I don't know about all that kind of stuff, but in a more basic world, you can't start painting the walls until you actually have the drywall up there, right? We know that there is a precedence, a relationship between those two activities. After structure is in place, the architect can reassess the design. We don't need to go through that. Anybody have any questions about dependency? This activity can't start until this one's done, and we know why, right? I mean, just you can't do it because you don't even have a wall to put up there yet. You probably don't want to put up walls until the guy came by and put all the electrical in, right? Because while he might be able to fish all that wire, it's much better to do all that electrical and plumbing and stuff, the rough-in stuff, before you put up the walls, right? Before you put up the drywall. So you have dependencies, and we'll talk about mandatory dependencies and sort of soft logic dependencies. So we have, oh, and here we are right there, mandatory, a relationship that is contractually required or inherent in the nature of the work. So contractually required is you, the, you know, the, um, the inspectors say you can't put your drywall up until after I get in and I look at these outlet to make sure that they're set up right. So that would be a mandatory relationship that is contractually required. Whereas you you know you could put the drywall up even though he hasn't inspected it yet, but you know he's making you do that. It's a it's a it's a contractual thing. Um whereas you can't put the wall up if you haven't put that electrical in or you can it can, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That gets more into the inherent nature of the work. Discretionary relationship is established based on the knowledge of best practices within a particular application area or aspect of a project where specific sequence is desired. So um, we get into things like that when we talk about um, crashing and fast tracking things. We'll get to those in a little bit when we get into the, the, the PDM stuff and critical path. But essentially, if I'm painting a room, I can paint the room and I can carpet at the same time. It's possible. I'm not putting carpet on the walls, and they're not putting paint on the floor. However, I don't want to get carpet fibers in my paint, and I don't want to get paint on my carpet. So it's a discretionary relationship. I say I'm waiting until after the walls are painted before I put down my carpet, actually after my walls are dry before I put down my carpet. That's a discretionary relationship. External, a relationship between project activities and non-project activities. So um this usually gets into the more um administrative type activities so 
um, hey, you can't do this until like like when I was talking about with uh, it's a, it was a mandatory thing, but it's also probably an external thing. Um, the inspection isn't really a project activity, I guess you could say. I don't know if that would fit in that example or not, but it, it's he's not installing the outlets and he's not installing the walls. He's just make sure that you hook, the, hook those things up right, um, and you'll have those types of non-project activities out there. I mean, somebody might consider inspection as part of the project. In fact, most stuff, if it's holding things up, it's it's probably part of the project. And then contingent on inputs from the project team's control. And again, that, that actually might fall into that same thing too, contingent on inputs within the project. Oh, okay, so that would be different. So, that, so the external might be an inspector, um, contingent on input. So if I have, um, you know, uh, well, that kind of gets, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. But stuff that's the team controls, that's an internal thing. Leave it at that. Anybody have any questions about mandatory or discretionary? Discretionaries will be important, just an FYI. Discretionaries will be important when you're when you're behind schedule. You have you have multiple paths through a project, and when we're fast tracking, we might be trying to do two activities at the same time um, that normally we would not do at the same time. But in in the essence of getting through this quickly, so we can meet a deadline, we might do that, like painting and putting carpet down at the same time. Um, and we'll see that more, or bringing in more people. And again, um, hey, you know, that's when we're crashing on a, on an item on the on the critical path. We want to we throw a whole bunch of extra people at that problem, and, and there are limits to doing that. And so we you got to be careful with that. There's a I use an example all the time. You can't nine women can't make a baby in one month. So um, <laughs> sometimes you just can't actually make it work you know you get diminishing returns you put more and more and more and more people on it you're getting diminishing returns and at some point you got people standing around doing nothing while the people that can work are working and then you might even be getting in their way so um we'll talk about that more in a little bit though any questions on mandatory discretion external or internal all right Precedence relationships precedence relationship logical depends who used in the precedence diagramming method here we are, this is a critical path, the logical relationship between activities that describes the sequence in which activities should be carried out. So I finish this one, I start the next task. I finish this one, I start the next task. I finish this one, I start the next task. That's the primary one that we'll use. That's That was the big one that we used on the exam. It was all what we called finish to start. I finish this task, I start the next one. Um, each activity has start and finish dates. The precedence relationships are always assigned to activities based on dependencies of each activity. Predecessor activities drive the relationship and most often occurs first. Successor activity is driven by the relationship. So when the predecessor is done, the successor starts. That's kind of the way things usually work. And we're gonna talk about how that doesn't work all the time. So here we have, a, these are the types of precedence relationships. Everybody needs to know these for the exam. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You'll need to know these. Finish to start. When I finish activity A, activity B can start. We also have what we call start to start. Um, these both can start at the same time. Activity A can start at the same time. Activity B can start. Um, activity finish to finish, these both have to finish at the same time. So activity A and activity B are done at the same time, essentially. And then we have this one, this last one, the start to finish. And this is um, this one is a little complex, um, but let me give you an example of it, and hopefully this will help you out. Um, if you are, uh, if you ever worked in the medical field, a nurse, or as a police officer, or something, the shift work. Um, I can't go home until my relief gets here. I can't leave. My shift doesn't end until the other guy starts. That's what's happening when we talk about the start to finish. I can't, I can't finish until he starts. So, activity B in this case is actually the, um, what's driving the the relationship. When the, I, this guy, when he gets here, activity A can go is done. But we can't finish activity A until activity B starts. And I, I'm not sure. I'm hard pressed to find examples outside of like, 
you know, if you work as a nurse, you can't leave until your relief comes in. You can't, your shift isn't over until they, the other person starts there. Same as a police officer, same as other things like that. Hey, but, man, would, it, would, yes. it be some, would it be something like um, maybe the painting can't start until the drywall is put up? Well, but so that would really be finished to start. The, it's the, the drywall is finished activity A, then you can start painting. Okay. Yeah. So they have a, a good example in our in our book here. It's oh. that you know uh, ticket sales on activity B don't end until the concert activity A starts. Oh, know? there you go. There you go. There's one. So th that's an example. Um, I just just make sure you know that what's what's happening there. You'll probably have a question on that. It won't be the big thing. The big question on the other exam prior to this year was all finished to start. It, every, your your diagram was all finished to start. You have to worry about all these other things, but you did not have to know what these other ones were because you would have questions about them. Just the, this one here, you would actually do the whole diagram and then and then answer a bunch of questions on it. So that that's that. I don't know if anybody else has any questions about these. Just know these backwards and forwards. Hey, Matt, what's I... most common yeah. in Agile? I'm sorry. What what's most common in Agile? At Agile is almost always going to be finished to start. You finish this activity, you start the next activity. Um, so, I mean, you might be doing things. Um, you might, some people might have them finish to finish. You know, all these activities finish at the end of the sprint. But generally, even Agile doesn't encourage that. You know, hey, you know, these are all done at the at the end of the sprint kind of thing. That's uh, act, just primarily, almost everything is going to be finished to start, and the big questions on the exam will be finished to start. Just know what these other ones are. They These start at the same time, these finish at the same time, and A doesn't finish until B starts. That's, that's Matt, the what was thing. the example that the person shared earlier? Because I didn't, I couldn't understand what you said. They, they were talking about ticket sales at a concert. So if you sell your, you know, you're selling tickets, up until the time the concert starts. You don't stop selling tickets unless you sold out, I guess, until the concert actually Perfect. starts. Thank you. Yep, that makes okay. sense. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Guidelines to sequence project activities. Review the schedule management plan. We talked about all that already. Review the activity list of all the projects. So we created our activity list a little earlier. Review the activity attributes for each activity. All the stuff that we have to do in each activity, we want to know what they are because, you know, they might help determine our, our sequence. Review the milestone list for the dates for specific scheduled milestone events. You've got to know when all these things have got to be done. Review the project scope statement, and that's going to tell us all of our activities. We're going to make sure we don't forget something when we plan this out. Review the EEFs and OPAs. Use tools and techniques such as PDM, which we're going to talk about, dependency determination, leads and lags, to develop the project schedule and network diagram. Um, leads and lags we'll talk about a little bit more in a little bit. They're You'll probably have a question or two on that, but it shouldn't be in the big the big question. Um, and PDM is just another it's a network diagram um, for what we're doing. Document the project schedule, network diagram, and update any project documents as needed. Any questions about this right now? We're going to go into this a little more detail here coming up. All right, so activity duration estimates. So quantitative assessment of likely number of time periods that are required to complete an activity. Ten minutes two days, three months, whatever. So this is just, <laughs> that's pretty simple. It's telling us how long it's gonna to take to do this. Elapsed time, uh, this is the calendar time required for an activity from start to finish. So if it's a eight hour task, but I started on Friday afternoon, it's the elapsed time is gonna actually be more than eight hours, right? It'll probably be, we started at noon on Friday and we finish it at noon on Monday. Um, that elapsed time is three days as opposed to one day. Effort is the number of labor units required to complete a scheduled activity or WPS component, often expressed in hours, days, or weeks, contrast with duration. So if I have a task that we say we can get done in one week, um, it's one week because I have five people working on it as opposed to five weeks with one person working on it. So effort is kind of important there. Effort is also a big driver for Agile in the point system. We talked about that before. Those points are a measure of effort. Any question on this? This is pretty straightforward stuff right here. I don't think this is too complicated. Anybody have any questions about it? I don't want to downplay it. If you've got a question, feel free to ask it. 
Okay. Guidelines to estimate activity durations. <laughs> so involve the work package owner. So get everybody involved that needs to know that can help out determine this, these uh, activity durations. Consult your lessons learned. Hey, before we underestimated this, the last 10 times we did this, we underestimated, let's not do that this next time. Uh, so we look at those lessons learned, review the schedule management plan, which told us how to do this stuff, right? We talked about that schedule management plan, told us how we're going to estimate this out. Determine how you want to quantify the work that needs to be done. Are you doing it in hours? Are you doing it in man hours? Are you doing it in months, weeks, years, whatever? Consider the resource requirements and capabilities. Um, I just found out today that most of the folks that I work with in Tel Aviv are off this whole week because it's Passover. Um, <laughs> if I, I, I have to consider my requirement, uh, my, you know, my resource requirements and capabilities. They can't do it because they're not here. Um, or I've got a whole bunch of people who just graduated from college and they have very little experience coding with what we're doing, or they have, they're all brand new laborers, or they're all, they haven't done it, it's going to take them longer to do stuff. We have to take those things into consideration. Review the resource requirements for each activity. What do I need for this? And what do I need for that? I can't have, you can't give me a Python program who never touched Java if, if this is all a Java thing. Consider interaction with the uh, projects or operations. Um, hey, can we do this without interfering with their testing or without messing up their production stuff? Review the project scope statement for assumptions and constraints. You know, hey, we're assuming that I'm going to have 10 people working on this all the time, and I'm really only going to get five. Maybe that's something I have to change that. Uh, or other constraints or assumptions. There's tons of them out there, potentially. Review the risk register to consider any risk that may affect the resource estimation. So remember, I don't know if you actually covered risk yet or not, any of the stuff. You probably got some of that earlier. Um, but you wrote down those risks, and you said, hey, we can have a problem here, 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 and here. One of the big places we're going to find risk is schedule. Scope, schedule, and and uh, cost are the three big risk factors that we have in a project. And we're talking about schedule right now. So there's, there's considerable chance that risk is going to pop up in, in, in this whole schedule process. Review the resource breakdown structure of resources listed by category and type. We don't emphasize the risk, the resource breakdown structure as much as we do the work breakdown structure, but it's the same type of thing. We have our resources and we break those down into their different talents and skills and things like that. We're going to use tools and techniques to do this, as in using expert judgment, as in using parametric estimating, as in doing Monte Carlo estimates, as in you know interviewing folks, as in doing all these other things. We use all these different tools and techniques that we have. Um, probably a better place to look at those is in Chapter 6 of the PMBOK. Um, you can look at all the business processes in there and look tools and techniques, probably a whole lot of that is going to apply for you here. Um, document activity duration estimate. So once you've figured out how long it's going to be, you want to write it down somewhere. Schedule presentation format, you have the Gantt chart, you have the milestone chart, and you have the project schedule network diagram with dates. The Gantt chart, we kind of saw that before. You have all your activities, and this activity, you know, they have the bar graph, so you can kind of see where it is. You know, you have this activity dependent on this, so this bar starts after that bar and so forth. The milestone chart, all those little, all those big long lines are really essentially their little diamonds. It's the milestones. And then your project schedule network diagram, that's what we're going to talk about coming up here. Any questions so far? Gantt chart. Okay, Gantt chart, bar chart. We just talked about this earlier. You got all these little bars here. Um, and all these activities, this one is dependent on this, so it kind of stretches out and you can see when your project ends and you can see what's the big chunks of your project. Uh, it shows your start and end dates, durations, and the order. It shows the precedence relationships. This is related to that. This is dependent on this. This is dependent on this and so forth. It shows percentage completion and actual progress. If you're filling those things in, yeah, it'll show that. Um, used to present project status to the project team and management. You can use these to say, boss, this is where we are in this, or you can show this to the team and say, hey, this is where we are in this good job, or hey, this is where we are, get off your ass and start working harder kind of thing. 
So we use this to, to determine where we are and, and where we need to be compared to where we need to be. A milestone chart. Now you see we got these little diamonds here. These are the these are the milestones. And you'll notice that these milestones are all just dots on a on a line instead of a bar. So these are these are the milestones that we're that we're concerned about. This are this indicates we're done with this. This is probably indicating we're done with this. And you might have a um you know, like I said, it's like your birthday. It's all these things make up your birthday, but this is the Oh, there's not one on that one. All of these things make up your birthday, but this is the date you celebrate it. This is the time it actually, but it's really, it's just a milestone. It's not the whole year of your existence, your last year of existence. Any questions about milestone charts? Generally speaking, they're little diamonds in Microsoft Project. I don't know what other shapes they use, but it's not really detailed. It's just, hey, we're done here, we're done here, we're done here. We have to have these things done by this point in time. Don't really care about how necessary how long it takes to do them. Then we have the project schedule network diagram with dates. This is the critical path type of thing here. We have our activity A and B and C, D, E, F, G, and H. So we have this all these activities, and you can see the precedences. B is dependent on A. C is dependent on B. F is also dependent on B, and so forth. And then activity H is dependent on E and G, kind of thing. Any questions about this so far? This is what we're going to be talking about here. You'll see these TFs. This is total float. Um, we'll get into this in a little more detail. Any questions about the network diagram with dates? Okay, so critical path. The critical path is a sequence of activities that represents the longest path through the project, which determines the shortest possible duration. So back to looking at this thing again. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have two paths through. We have A, B, C, D, E, and H is one path through, and we have A, B, F, G, and H is another path through. So we have two paths through. The shortest path through is going to be these guys where we see the zeros. We have no, no we have total float of zero. These total floats mean I can add 11 days here or wherever and still get done on time, still get done by day 66. Add a day to any of these projects where there's a zero, I won't get done by day 66. And that is the essence of critical path. Anything where I add an item or add time to an activity on the critical path will delay the project. That is that is your critical path. So we have our start, we have our activity. We go to this one here. This is well, this kind of probably looks like the other one did. I don't know if it's exactly the same time, but then they added up all these things and that gave you a 16 week critical path. Any questions so far? It's the longest path through the project which determines the shortest possible duration. Any questions? Okay. Critical path activity, any activity on the critical path in a project schedule. So Something to keep in mind when we talk about critical path, I hear people use that term a lot, and it's something you have to get into your brain. People say an activity is critical, and they call it a critical path activity. It doesn't mean that it's a critical path activity. It does not mean it's important or not important. It has nothing to do with its importance. It has to do with when we're doing it and, and whether it's going to, if the delay will cause us to, to delay the project. So, for instance, a very minor, what appears to be a very minor activity that's only a few days, um, and it, no one would say, oh, it's super critical to this thing has got to get done. It, it may be critical that it has to be done, but it's on the critical path because if we delay it, we delay the project. So when somebody says something's really important, if I can do that really important thing in two days, but it's dependent. I'm also have another activity run at the same time that takes two weeks. That's not so critical. It's it's not critical path, even if it's a really critical item. So let's get into float total float. This TF guy up here. Total float is the early start. Well, you have early start equals late start, and early finish equals the late finish. When this when these are equal to zero, you have a zero total float. So we have a early start and a early late start are 25. So we have a total float of zero. Or early finish and a late finish of 41, we have a total float of zero. These are 
on the critical path. Total float is zero. You see the TF equals zero here. These items here, we have a total float of 11. We have a critical, the early start, I'm sorry, the early finish ends on day 29, and the late finish can end as late as day 40. So we just do a sub simple subtraction here, and we get a total float of 11. 40 minus 29 equals 11. So I can delay activity C by 11 days, and I still get done on time. I can still get done on time. The same thing with activity D, and same thing with activity E. Any one of these things I could delay. I can't delay. Maybe I can delay them all. I don't know. Look at the, the numbers. Yes, we could delay all of them and still be done on time. Um, so these activities down here, if I add an extra day duration here, this becomes 67. If I add an extra day here, this becomes 67. I add an extra day here, this becomes 67. I add an extra day here, this becomes 67. We finish on the day later. Any, anybody have any questions about critical path so far? I know there's going to be other questions because we're going to have to calculate all these other numbers out, and that's all part of the critical path process. So, so could like uh, adding the um, workers staffing would that be part of the critical path in terms of because if you don't get the workers, you you can't get the activities done. That is um, a good question, and and that's really not a part of the critical path. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more and a, 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 a little a little bit later. Let's go through this right now. Let's assume that. Each of, when we first do this diagram, we say, okay, activity, we talked to them, they said they can do this in 10 days. And they, these guys said they could do this in 15 days. And these guys said they could do this in four days. And these guys said they could do this in eight days. And these guys said they can do this in 13 days and so forth. We, we complete this activity first. Now, we'll start applying other things where there is other dependencies, like, for instance, this guy says he can do this in eight days, but he can't start this until 20 days after this starts. So then we got we may have a problem. Okay, but for our diagram purposes, we don't worry about that just yet. Okay, <clears throat> we will talk about that. There are other dependencies that we'll have to take into consideration, but for our initial diagram, we don't worry about that part. Okay. All right. So. Oh, so let's see, we're talking about total float here. We'll come into the free float in a minute here. So float is the amount of time an activity can be delayed from its early start without delaying the project finish date or the consecutive activities. Now they had this consecutive activities. This is related to the free float part. And we'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. But float is we're gonna miss our end date. Total float is we're missing our end date. Free float is going to impact our consecutive, uh, consecutive activity. And we'll get into that here in just a minute. Um, so our total float again, this is delaying the project. If we add a day here, we went through any one of these activities where we have zero total float. So how, how would one calculate uh, which is the critical path? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. <laughs> so we'll go through that. Um, so. If, We'll get to that one there. Free float, this is when we have a, um, you'll have free float when you have two activities coming together to a, that are a predecessor for a single activity. So I could delay activity E by 11 days and still start this on day 61. Um, because this can't, this one has to start on day 61 is the, from, because down here on the, on the, the critical path. Um, activity G is end on day 61, so we start on day 61. Um, and but here, I our early finish is day 50, but I could go day 51, and I can still start on day 61. I can do 52, I can still start on day 61, so forth. Um, this one actually kind of throws a monkey wrench at the same times here. You see other Sorry. examples. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but how, how did you get the early start, early finish, late start, late finish, and all that other stuff? <laughs> we'll get to those. We, we'll get we'll get to those. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll get to that. Okay. that okay. That's that. Well, maybe we won't. I thought that was in here, but let's see here. Oh, you know what? Um, hang on just a second here. Well, we'll we'll talk about this. We'll walk through this process. Okay. 
Um, I was thinking this was actually in here, but there's actually another class. In fact, Chris is on the call, and he's going to be teaching that to you guys a little bit later. But we'll we'll kind of go over it now. So we have an activity. One of the things that you'll get on the exam, or you did, I'm assuming that you still will, is they would have a list of activities. So they would have activities A through H, and they would tell you their dependencies. And they would tell you which ones have no dependency, like activity A can start whenever. Um, and they will tell you your durations of the, each of those activities. So somebody went through an estimate. Remember, we did that earlier. We took all those activities and we generated an estimate for all our activities. So we created the list of activities and then we estimated those list of activities out. So we have this duration. We know what those are for all of these activities. And then we take our early start, we start at zero, and we're going to add 10 days as our duration, and we get our early finish on this activity. And then on activity B, we start on day 10, because it's when we ended there. Um, and then we say, okay, it's 15 days, so we're going to add that to the 10, we get 25 days. So we see we got 25 days, so this is when this one ends. Now, I just want to make sure that I'm following you, so you got, okay. uh, I'm going to just... Uh... You got four point uh, starting in activity A, 4.2.1, that is your WBS. Um, is that yeah, why these are the, th of? well, these are activity numbers here. Just just okay, don't worry okay. about those parts. Just think activities okay. A through and, H. And so and you're, you're saying the earliest, uh, how did you um, get a, an early start of, a, oh, I'm sorry, on the on activity B, how did you get an, an early start of, of 10? Because t B can't start until A is done. So I see, okay, okay. okay. So, okay. so A finishes and B starts. We have that, we have that finish to start relationship. So when B was, A was done at 10, B starts at 10. Um, and then you took those 15 days, so you got 25. So now these, both of these are dependent on B, they can both start on day 25. So we see that we have that there. Um, activity C, add those four days for the duration, you get 29. And then you carry that over to the next one. You add the eight days, so you're going to get 37. And then you take 37, you carry it over, and we're going to add 13 to that, so we get 50. And down here, we do the same thing. We get 25, we add 16, we got the 41. So this one can start on day um well, that's weird. Um, oh, I'm so see, and, now, and this one here, I'm sorry. Here they actually have a, they have they have lag time. So you have a you have I'm sorry lead time. So you have no lag time. I'm sorry, it's lag time. So you had eight days. So this one says you can start on day 49. So like you painted the walls here. Um, we're not going to put our carpet down until the paint dries, and for some reason it takes eight days for the paint to dry. So you had to wait eight days. So you start on day 49, and then you add the 12, you got 61 days, and we bring that 61 up here. We also have that, we have 50, but we use 61 here. And this is what happens when we go, when we're moving from left to right on the critical path, when we do our what we call our forward path through, you calculate all these things out. Now we have two activities come together. Whenever we have this kind of a confluence where two activities are precedents for a single successor, you're going to have this problem where you have two different numbers. Well, this one can't start. It either has to start on day 50 or day 61. And since this is dependent on this, you pick, obviously, you pick the larger number, right? So we're picking the larger number, which is 61. Moving from left to right, whenever you have two activities converge on a single activity, you're going to pick the larger early finish time to work with. And then when we do this, we take that 61 days plus our five, so we got 66 as our early finish. Then we just turn it around, and, and again, Chris is going to go over this in more detail later on, but you'll take this and we'll take that 66, we'll bring it down to our late finish. So our late finish and early finish are the same times on that very last activity. And so on 66, we're going to subtract the five days from that, so we got 61. So this is our late start time. So we can start this as late as 61, and since it's on critical path, they're going to be the same number. So now we got the same kind of thing going back the other way. So we got 61 as, as, as the latest this activity can start. Um, so, sir? Yes. Sir, uh, mm -hmm. before you keep going, just uh, just want to clarify something. Going back to what you said about the larger number, 
Uh huh. Let's say, for example, in activity E, the early finish was 71. Okay. Than, okay. So the early finish in activity E was 71, and the late finish in, or the, so would the 71 be in lieu of the 61 on the early start of activity H? Yes, it would. In fact, if we had, if you had changed the early finish, on activity E to 71, uh -huh. first of all, you're talking about you're adding 21 days to the thing, right? So right. this is no longer 13 days, it's 34 days for the duration of this activity. And guess what? That changes the critical path, does it not? Because now this yeah. is 71, so now our critical path is actually longer. And now instead of 61, which is the bigger number here, 71 is the bigger number, that would go here, and then we would go 71 plus 5 would so, be 75, and then we would. Right, right. Back. So on the, on the late start of activity H, would that be the early finish of G? The, so it would be. Well, 17. wait, the late start. Well, let's not get late start. Let's start with early start first. The early start is going to be 71, okay? Right. And you're going to add 5, and you're going to get 75. I'm sorry, right. 76. Right. Okay. So then you're going to bring the 76 down, you're going to subtract 5, and you're going to get 71. It's going to become your late start activity here. Okay. So this can start as late as day 71. Okay, so that's okay. so, so, so I just want to make sure you can see, I think that's where I got my confusion. Activity G was 61. So that early finish on G being 61 is negated if the early finish on E is 71. That means the early start is still 71. And then you're working backward for the late start. Okay. Right. And okay. and what we're gonna see is on critical path that these items are gonna early start and late start are gonna be the same and early finish and late finish are gonna be the same. Right. And total float and free float are gonna be zero on the critical path. Now when you change the critical path, you that changed everything. Okay. But let's let's go back to this one first of all. So then we'll go through the process. And you guys, first time you do this, it's complicated. Second time it's a little easier. You do a bunch of these and you can do this in your sleep. Just as a FYI. Uh I I'm I'm pretty good with these kinds of things, but I think most people that have spent time doing them, it's you know, you might not remember it. A, a month after the exam, but you'll remember it for the exam if you put the time in and do a lot of these. So we have our late start is 61, and we take our late start and we're going to pass that to our late finish on the on the activities, the succeeding uh, the preceding activity. So we take our late start becomes our late finish, and our late finish you can see that down here, and you can see that up here. And up here we took 13 from the 61 and we got 48 and we took 48 minus the eight. We moved that down here. We took the 48 minus the eight, we got 40. We moved the 40 over here. We subtract the four, we got 36 and we got 36 here. Same kind of thing down here. We had the 61, we subtracted 12, we got 49. We moved that 49. Oh, we had that eight day thing, which they like to mess that up here, but that's you know the lag thing. So you got that eight days here, and so you got to add, subtract those eight days. You get that forty-one here, forty-one minus sixteen, you get twenty-five. Now here we got another problem. We're converging on an activity from going from right to left, and our late start here is twenty-five, and our early start here, our late start here is thirty-six. In this case, when we're going from right to left, we're going to use the lesser number. So we'll take the late start is the 25 as opposed to the 36, which is the bigger number. So we move the 25 to our late finish, minus 15, that gave us 10. We move the 10 over, minus the 10, that gave us a zero. And like I said, you guys are going to cover this in much more detail, but essentially when we're going from, from right to left, you're going to take your early start, you're going to start at zero, add your duration, and then that's going to be your early finish. Carry it over, add the duration, and you're going to do that. If you get a bifurcation like this, um, the succeeding the the, the succeeding or the succeeding activities are both going to use the same number because there's no problem here. 25 can go here. 25 can go here. But when you converge back on a single activity on a single path, you're going to use the larger number going from left to right. On the way back, you're going to complete your late finish and your your late start times, and you're going to do the late finish minus the duration is going to give you your late start. And then here, 
you're going to take that 61 because bifurcating into two, diverging is no problem. 61, 61 is fine. We're going to do our thing here. Now, this the lag here, the, um, yeah, the lag here, I'm not sure they'll have that on the exam or not. I mean, they had questions like that in, in the PMBOK. We talked about it, but we never saw that on the exam. So I don't know if you'll see that or not. Um, but you'll calculate here, you'll subtract, you'll get that number, you'll subtract, you'll get this number. You'll hear, you'll subtract the duration, you'll get this number. And when you get to another convergence on an activity, so these two predecessors, I'm sorry, these two successors come back to this predecessor, going from right to left, you'll use the lower number. And you can. So when you're subtracting backwards, the purpose for subtracting backwards is to. This calculates your late. This calculates your late start and your late finish times going backwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it has so, nothing to do with the with with the um um what do you call it the the when you uh, are finding your 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 path or I forgot the name of it. Well, it your, it, it it will help you calculate your path. Um, you you can't really calculate your total float i mean sorry your free float until you have completed you need to you need to know that your 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 times here for the this activity over here um when you go through this and you calculated your times out it's your durations when you got that you can add all these up and they'll tell you how long it's going to take if you add these times up here 10 plus 15 is 25, plus four is 29, plus eight is 37, plus 13 is 50, I'm sorry, is, um, my math is bad right now, I'm sorry, I'm tired. Anyway, you add all these activities up on along these zeros here, where you have no, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong direction, that's why this was, came out to be about 55 days, but you see 66, here we have 10 plus 15 is 25, plus 16 is 30, 41, plus 12, plus five is gonna give you 66. So if you add up all the durations for this path, A, B, C, D, E, and H, you'll see that that's a smaller number than A, B, F, G, and H. The larger number through is gonna be your critical path. So you don't need to see these, but if you need to, you need to calculate your free float, you need to know those. And you also, they're gonna ask you a question about, When's the latest you can start on this? And if you don't know, you and if it's on the critical path, it's easy because your late start and your early your late start and early start are the same times. But on your on off of the critical path, your early start is day 37, and your late start you can start as late as day 48. And here you can start as early as day 29, and as late as day 40, and so forth. So you need to be able to know those things too. So that's why we do the whole forward and backwards path. To just calculate the critical path, you could just add up durations and you're done. But you'll have more so, than that. I mean, your... My question is still, how were you able to, uh, for example, in activity B, you have an early start of 10 and an early finish of 25 with a duration right. of 15. Right. So you're saying that activity A and activity B could start at the same time? And if no, not, no, 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 they can't. What is your, how, how these is these are the day. These are the day. This is not the durations. The durations are 15 and 10. Activity A starts on day zero and it ends on day right. 10. Okay. Activity B starts on day 10 and ends on day 25. They can't start at the same time. B is dependent on A and it can't start until A is finished, which is day 10. So you start okay. on day 10 here and you add those 15 right. days and you get 25. And since they're on critical path, these they're going to end. They're going to their late start and late finishes are going to be the same as well. Um, so that that's why you calculate those out. It's the going walking through the path. You're going to figure these guys out across the top, and then you're going to take the 66 or whatever your number is in your early finish on your last activity, and you're going to move it down to your your late finish, and then you're going to work your way back the same way across those late fin late finishes and late starts. And once you get done with that, you'll have you'll be able to calculate your total float. If you subtract your late finish from your late start, that's your total float. 
I'm sorry, your late finish from your early finish, that's your total float. Here we got zero. Here, 61 minus 61 is zero. Here we got 61 minus 50 is 11, so we have total float. 48 minus 37 is 11, so we have total float. 40 minus 29 is 11, so we have total float. Here we got 66 minus 66, so we have no float, no total float at all. And you see right here, all those along critical path are always going to be zero on total float because you can't delay them at all without delaying the project. But then you've got free float. Here's this last one. You got free float, which is the same as a total float in this case because there's just these two paths and one activity after that. Um, and this is when our early finish, how, how long we could delay our early finish and still make our early start. This is this is strictly what the the free float is talking about. So I can delay this one by 11 days. If I get this done on day 61, I can still finish this guy on day 61. And essentially, it's this minus this. So our early start minus our, our early our early finish on an activity. So these are these are where we get our numbers for our free float. And now Chris and and Cindy will actually discuss this in a review where they cover this in a lot more detail but you guys this is this is the this is the critical path this is the main stuff that you'll see a big question well you did I don't know what you'll see now we they would give us a list of activities in a table and we had to put this the thing this whole thing together and we did this separately on a piece of paper and then they would ask us questions based on that and there was anywhere from five to like 15 questions um, so mine was like six questions, I think. I've heard people as many as 15 questions and as few as five questions on that. But it, it's a big part of the test, and you could, because you had, you had the past specific business process group questions. You could, if you failed any particular group, you could still fail the exam. So if you didn't do well on this, you could fail a particular group of of things and still fail the exam, even though you might have got a 80 percent. You know, if you got everything else right. So you got to be careful with this one, and that's why it's important, and that's why we have another class on this too, talking about this and then earned value management. Okay, I'm going to kind of move on here because we're almost out of time. So we have our agile release planning here, and essentially this is you have your release one that dictates your release plan here, and you got all these iterations for the year of this release, and then you have you'll have the same kind of thing for release two and the same kind of thing for release three. And then each iteration, you'll break down these into features and user stories. So you have here, it's feature B has three storage feature, C has four storage, et cetera. And, and each one of those user stories might have a, a separate task to do. So this is the agile release plan. It all kind of starts at the, at the story and works its way up. Any questions about agile release plan? It's pretty basic stuff there. Okay, ongoing progress based on methodology. Measuring the project progress with respect to schedule consists of monitoring the status of the project to update the project schedule, managing change to the schedule baseline, and an agile approach evaluate progress by compare the total amount of work delivered and accepted to the estimate of work to be completed, review completed work in a regular sprint demos, conduct schedule reviews and record lessons learned retrospectives and determine a rate of deliverables are produced, validated, and accepted. It's a lot of verbiage, and what they're essentially what we're saying here is that you're going to compare the total amount of work delivered with the accepted to the estimate of the work to be completed at that current period. So if I said I'm going to have activity A, B, and C, and D done, and at the end of that time period, I am only got up to C, that means I'm behind schedule, right? I didn't do D yet, and I should be having that done by now. So we're comparing the amount of work that we did to what we thought we were going to have. Review the completed work in a regular sprint demos. So after we deliver that, or after we finish that, we show it to the client. They say we like it. That's the sprint demo. We show them how it works. Conduct scheduled reviews to record lessons learned. You have the retrospective. This worked. This didn't work. We did this. We didn't like this. The client didn't like this. They liked this. They loved this. Blah blah blah. And then you try to apply that to your next sprint. And determine the rate at which deliverables are produced, validated, and accepted. This is what we call the velocity, that rate at which we're getting stuff done. So we said, okay, we're delivering 100 story points in a, in a sprint. That's kind of what we did. We produced, validated, and got 100 points of stuff accepted in a sprint. That's our velocity. So, and of course, yours might be more, it might be less. It could be the exact same amount of work, but different amount of points. Remember, we talked about that. It's it's, uh, it's relative. 
Okay, coordination with other products, of course, we always have to do that. Sometimes we have to wait for this or we have to wait for that, um, you know, or we can't do this because, you know, hey, we, for those of you that worked in IT, we used to have the holiday, I forget what they called it, right around Thanksgiving, everything was froze because we couldn't, they didn't want to mess with production stuff during the holidays. So we couldn't do any deployments after like November 17th until, until the new year. So um, that's coordinating with other products. We want to make sure that everything, we don't mess up somebody else's work when we're doing our thing. So our learning goals assess project needs and complexity, magnitude, determine the appropriate project methodology, methods, and practices. So we got to look at what we need, and, and that's one of the things we'll do. We'll plan and manage our scope. Well, this is actually coming from the other stuff. You don't need to worry about this so much on the schedule. A prepare plan, plan, prepare, modify, manage project schedule based on methodology. That's all of what we just talked about. Um, plan and manage the quality of wood quality is another topic, so we don't have to worry about that one right now. Integrate project planning activities. So uh, these other ones are kind of other activities that were in this in this deck, and you'll talk about these more. Okay, um, we are right at seven o'clock. Um, I am actually. Let me do this. Um, I'm going to keep the bridge open here for another 10, 10 minutes or so, answer questions. Um, anybody that doesn't want to hang around, you guys can go ahead and go ahead and drop. I won't keep you here any longer than you need to, but I'm here for questions for, for the next 10 minutes or so. Anybody have any questions?